Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another monthly economic briefing from the Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise at UNC Keenan Flagler Business School. I'm Rob Knapp, External Affairs Associate with the Institute, and we're glad to have you with us this morning. So we've been doing these briefings since about May, and we've had some constants as we've done them. Number one, inflation, high. Number two, the Fed, busy because inflation is high. And number three, a strong jobs market. And it seems like that is continuing. The numbers came out this morning. The words we were seeing associated with it were resilient and a little weaker, but still strong. So we have a lot to sort out as we always do on these mornings. Luckily, we have uh, Keenan Flagler, Professor Christian Lundblad, who will be here with us in a moment to sort through it all. But before he gets here, especially for the folks who are new with us, let's go over a few things about how this works. Professor Lundblad will give his analysis in the first 15 minutes. After that, it will be time for your questions. So this is where you come in. If you have a question for Professor Lundblad, please submit it to us. You can do that now. You don't have to wait until the Q&A part. You can do that using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We're going to try to get to as many questions as we can inside of our 30 minutes. We'll be ending up about 9.30 Eastern time. Now, if you are a member of the press, you could let us know that. Please include your name, uh, title, and organization with your question, and we'll make sure to give those questions priority. In addition, if you're joining us by phone today, you can still submit your questions. You can email them to me. I'm at rob underscore nap at keenan-flagler.unc.edu. So send them my way. All right. I think that's everything we need to know. So at this point, it's time to bring on Professor Lundblad to give us some analysis and some insight into what's going on this morning. Good morning, Christian. Good morning, everyone. How are you? All right, so let's uh, let's get started, everyone. It's a pleasure to share uh, some thoughts with you. Um, and so we just got our labor market report on the back end of, uh, of an otherwise busy week uh, with the Fed meeting. And um, if anything, this uh, report is going to put some additional pressure on the Fed. I think that's the big um, that's the big takeaway. So uh, let's walk through a little bit of this, and then we can talk for a moment about the Fed um, and, and where they're headed as a consequence, perhaps. Uh, so we got uh, you know, a surprise on the upside um, with respect to uh, the, um, the actual um, jobs that were created as, uh, you know, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last month. And in addition, we got uh, a revision upwards. And so not only were we surprised in terms of the jobs created in the previous month, but that also is... Kind of cumulative sense and upward revision uh, in uh, in where what we saw um, you know over the last couple of months and so that that's perhaps not what the what the Fed was expecting to see and so you kind of put all that together and uh, you know we're continuing to see uh, pretty healthy job growth uh, in uh, in terms of uh, overall non farm employment and that's that's isolated I would say um, to some sectors more than others so some things that we saw were with respect to education and health services, um, some additional job growth in leisure and hospitality and, and other professional and business services. That's all sort of in, um, despite, you know, some of the headlines that we're hearing in the technology side, you know, over the last couple of days, not the least of which is the um, tumultuous nature, let's say, of, of, of Mr. Musk. But leaving that aside, uh, you know, this kind of holistically looks like uh, a pretty healthy job report, I would say. And, and Maybe one place that is a little bit murky, to be clear, uh, is if we look at the unemployment figure. So the unemployment figure, on the one hand, uh, is at what is essentially a 50-year low. Um, but we did see a slight upward tick this month. And I want to just remind that, you know, that where we learn about the unemployment figure comes from a household-based survey and where we learn about job creation comes from an establishment survey. And actually, the household survey uh, is showing some job declines, uh, where the uh, the establishment survey is what I just showed you with some significant job increases, and so there's a little bit of a mixed picture to be to be fair, um, but I don't want to overplay that. Uh, you know, insofar as you know, the unemployment rate 
which comes from, um, from this alternative uh, survey is still really robust. And if you kind of even, even take a broader view of unemployment, which sort of looks at those that are maybe marginally attached, so they're working part-time but would like to work full-time, or are, are maybe um, you know facing other kinds of, um, of of dislocations from the market that are that are, are less obvious in the traditional unemployment measure. I, still, this is really really remarkably low. So, this is still a, a very robust uh, labor market, I would say. And so, the question that we're pondering a little bit over here at the institute. I mean, if you sort of take the the job creation that we've at least seen from the establishment survey and kind of accumulate that over the COVID period, you know, we're we're now well above what we saw in the, in the pre-COVID-19 um, peak. And, uh, and you know, a, a reasonable question one could ask is like, if we continue to crank out, you know, 200,000 plus jobs um, a month, at, like at some point we run out of laborers. And, and so that's look forward for some commentary from us where we're gonna try to dig into that question of like, what's the ultimate capacity in some, in some sense of this market? But clearly that intersects very deeply with the challenges that we're facing over here, because ultimately here is the question, and this is what the Fed in some way is struggling with, which is as this market continues to be um, characterized by a degree of tightness, right? Um, the, the really relevant thing over there is what's the price of that resource? I mean, how tight is the market in terms of you know, what we're paying for the laborers? And what we did get today, despite a little bit of the mixed picture across these two different surveys, is an upward tick in hourly earnings. So we got a little bit of an upward surprise um, in, uh, in hourly earnings, kind of relative to where we were and where, relative to where we've been. Uh, and so uh, that's a true on a month-on-month -month basis. Um, the, the year on year um, is, uh, is, is coming down a little bit just because of what's been happening you know, over the months uh, since the last year. But nevertheless, you know, sort of holistically, this is um, you know, some pretty impressive labor growth uh, you know, in terms of, of, of wage compensation. And, uh, and there really isn't any clear um, signal yet that that is abating. And so why is that important? Because that's what ultimately starts to put some pressure perhaps on margins for firms. And to the extent that firms can pass that along, they do. And, uh, and then ultimately that continues to put pressure on broad inflationary concerns. And that's where the Fed obviously has been most aggressive. So we do continue to see some wage acceleration along this dimension. And so ultimately then the question for the remainder of our time is like, right, what does this mean for the Fed? And what would we need to see in order for the Fed to start to envision a peak, kind of a you know a terminal rate as they as they call it, and then ultimately some reversal in their activity. And so let's talk about inflationary numbers. So one next week we're going to see an update on CPI, and the expectation there, at least on a year-on-year -year basis, is is an eight percent number. That's still a really high number. Here's an alternative figure that we we've seen a little bit more recently, which are um, our our, pers our prices associated with personal consumption, so household consumption. And so here, here's one piece of good-ish news, and then I'm going to moderate that in, in just a moment. So the, kind of the year-over-year -year increase in this is a little bit below what we'll see on the CPI, perhaps. Um, but if we kind of look at the at the three-month rolling average or the six-month rolling average in, in a way, um, you know what what we can see over here is maybe some moderation in in kind of the more recent months. This is the headline number, so it includes things like say, you know, energy costs. And uh, we know, you know, despite the high prices we're paying at the pump, some of that has moderated to some degree, thankfully. But if we look at just core, which is we strip out some of those energy costs and, 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 and some other more volatile components, um, we don't see that same kind of moderation. So uh, even here, you know, we've seen this kind of continued, uh, you know, inflationary pressure dynamics that are just vexing. And so, you know, if anything, today's report might suggest some additional pressures on margins that could continue to create a pass-through effect. Um, you know, we'll have to see, but it, it, this doesn't really, this isn't kind of what the Fed was hoping for in terms of seeing some moderation here and, and facilitating kind of the soft landing in the labor market, uh, along with um, then some of the abatement of the associated wage and inflationary pressures along that particular dimension. And so ultimately then, you know, I think there's every reason to, to imagine that the Fed is going to continue to move in the way that they move. So here is the Fed's uh, par policy rate, the target rate on, on the Fed funds market. And as we saw on Wednesday, the Fed is all in for the time being. 
Uh, we obviously saw another 75 basis point increase with Powell using some pretty strong language like we still have some ways to go. Uh, and so this report here um, doesn't really necessarily suggest that there's going to be any sharp uh, reversal with respect to, um, you know, to expectations uh, along that particular dimension. The, the, this has not significantly moved markets this morning, to be fair. So the equity market is reasonably quiet. Um, the bond market with a little bit of a move this morning is still relatively flat. Uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I think this kind of accelerates, um, you know, the expectation that the Fed is, is going to continue to, to be aggressive to tackle the inflationary component of their mandate, um, because we're not really seeing any concerns about uh, labor markets that is the other side of their dual mandate, um, you know, at present. So, so let's talk a little bit about that forecast, but I want to take one digression just for the, you know, for the audience to, to remind that the Fed has certainly post-financial crisis more than one tool at its disposal. And so the other one that I just want to remind on before we talk about, you know, where they may be headed is their balance sheet. So they have printed an awful lot of money in traditionally unorthodox ways through the expansion of their balance sheet. You know, if we go back to the financial crisis and kind of roll this all the way through and think about the very aggressive things they did in COVID, you know, this amounts to several trillion dollars of kind of non-traditional money printing. And this has been rolling off to some degree. But what was you know, referred to as quantitative easing and is now being referred to as quantitative tightening, this is also going to have to be an important part of the story. That is, they're going to have to remove some of this created liquidity, and, uh, and that's going to be in lockstep or commensurate with the increases in the interest rates that we're going to inevitably have to continue to see. And so this will put some additional pressures on interest costs uh, out there. And so the combination of kind of raising their traditional interest rate and kind of removing some of the balance sheet support that they've um, that they've offered, I think that's what we're seeing here. So this ultimately is what matters for um, you know uh, players out there. Uh, and so if you look at the green, which is our government's financing cost, you know, if or if you look at the orange, which is you know traditional house household financing costs for mortgages, or if you look at the blue, which is a kind of you know reasonably high credit quality uh, um, bond cost. So think about corporates that are raising financing in order to pursue um, you know, whatever their, their strategic objectives are. We've just seen a really sharp turnaround here. And that is putting pressures in some degree on, on firms. They talked a bit about that in the earnings cycle. Uh, but uh, I think there's every reason to continue to expect this going forward, you know, given the, you know, the pressures that, um, you know, that we're continuing to see and the expectation that the Fed is going to continue to operate in this. So ultimately, while the Fed is moving around its narrow interest rate policy target and maybe working also on its balance sheet dimensions, this ultimately is what matters for economic agents in our economy. And the elevated interest costs are at some point going to have to bear. And as the Fed continues to lean on that, that's going to have to put some pressure. And ultimately, the idea there is to slow that down in a way that hopefully is not too disruptive, but one could ask a question if the Fed has no choice but to engineer a recession. I mean, that's sort of ultimately the question that we're facing. So, so let's talk about two signals of where that might be before we, we wrap up and open up for questions. So there's two places where we could look about where the Fed is expected to go. One is the signaling that they offer to us through their own disclosures. So that's off, offered with what they call the dot plot. And so this comes from, uh, from, from the, the Fed's own um, uh, kind of, you know, uh, every other meeting uh, disclosure. So this comes from September's meeting. We did not get an update on this figure in the meeting on Wednesday. We'll, we will get a refresh on this in December. But this is kind of where they themselves think they ought to be uh, in, um, you know, at the end of this year and at the end of next year. And so you can see that, you know, while we're kind of in this range now, there's some significant expectation that the Fed is going to continue to move going forward. So these, that's what these different dots represent or different members of, um, of, of the, uh, the open market committee that determines their interest rate policy, kind of signaling where they themselves ought to go. So again, some expectation from their own signaling. And then the second place from which we learn is financial markets, right? And so the Fed 
funds futures market is a derivatives market that actually bets on where the Fed is headed. And, uh, and I want to show you two things, uh, which uh, I think are kind of interesting. One is as we stand here today and we look at where the Fed is, uh, and then we sort of you know, map this out into kind of the end of this year, and then going out into say 2023, you know, what we get over here is the market sort of clearly assessing that the Fed is gonna be moving continually sharply going forward. And then maybe there is some expectation that they could reverse as we get into 20, you know, end of 2023, 2024. But what I can show you here is this, the second thing, which is this Delta between the green and the orange. The green is kind of where this market was at the end of last week versus where the market was after the meeting. And so uh, not only did the sharp movement sort of, you know, uh, you know, force the market to be, um, you know, more accepting of the idea, but, but so too did, did Powell's um, un unambiguous language. And so now this market is kind of pricing things as the Fed's expected uh, rate as we get into 2023 is gonna be well above 5%. And if anything, this, this morning is, is probably only going to sharpen that as we kind of look closely at this derivative market going forward. And so the last thing I'll show you, and then we'll open it up for questions, is here. This is the yield curve. This is where our reasonably short-term United States borrowing costs, either a three-month or a two-year cost in kind of blue or orange, respectively, in comparison with a long-run borrowing cost. And we like to look at this difference because the short rates give us a sense of kind of where the Fed is now or likely to be in the near term versus where we kind of expect the Fed to go over the life of a longer term bond. And so when these rates start to uh, fall, and in particular, the spread here starts to become negative, what we would call invert, what you can see is in earlier times, when you see a negative rate, they're then preceding these gray bars, which are documented recessions from the NBER. And so this is a signal. Does that mean we're calling a recession yet? Not necessarily, but it does suggest that the bond market is increasingly concerned about that reality. And so if anything, you know, again, uh, moves like today, ironically, a sharp uh, an upward move relative to what we expected in the labor market, puts additional pressure on the Fed to be aggressive and maybe for longer. And then ultimately the question then, as I said, is does the kind of wage and inflationary pressures that we see as a consequence force the Fed to have no choice but to engineer a recession and the bond market is starting to express some concerns. So I'll open it up for questions now, but I think ultimately that's kind of the takeaway. Again, this odd kind of dynamic and an and exciting labor market in some ways. I mean, it's great that Americans are employed and that wages are accelerating. But when you kind of take that up to the aggregate, that does put additional aggregate pressures. And the Fed is, is forced to react. And, uh, and in a way that uh, then, um, you know, puts some, some, you know, future pressure on where the economy might go as a consequence. So Rob, I'll open it up to questions now. And Thank you very much. Uh, another interesting employment report morning. Um, I've got to think the Fed is, I don't know if the Fed gets frustrated, but that's 475 basis point increases in a row and things aren't budging much at this point, are they? No. <laughs> so going forward, I guess the, the guess is, is, is 75 the new norm and I, I wouldn't take that away. So I would say, um, you know, the next one could very well be 50. Um, the market is kind of meaning one of those derivatives markets I alluded to is kind of somewhere between 50 or 75 as, as a guess. Uh, but, um, you know, there will be some moderation at some point, but it's really the question is kind of where does this peak? And the market is now very comfortable, and so am I, with the idea that the peak is going to have to be well above 5%. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Good to see the yield curve again. We'll make sure to send out a reference to an earlier piece we did on that to folks who get our email after. The briefing today. So off to questions. Uh, I'm going to read a couple off the paper the old-fashioned way. This one is from Adam Owens at WRAL. Adam asks, to what extent is the great resignation still happening and what effect is that having on business? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. I mean, we, we have not really seen a rebound in labor force participation among those 55 and older. 
So there has been kind of a recovery in labor force participation in kind of what's called prime age working, which is kind of 25 to 54. So that's that's kind of ground its way back. And so whatever disincentives you might have been worried about, you know, with respect to, you know, policy and stimulus and all of that, that, that seems to have rolled off in some degree. But the labor force participation in 55 and older hasn't bounced back. And so it seems like, you know, there's some folks that have just exited the labor market and, and that may have been accelerating, um, you know, uh, not just resignations, but retirements. And in a way, then that, that seems to be uh, semi-permanent. And that then means that there are, you know, a few million workers perhaps that are just permanently gone now. And so this, if the supply of labor is smaller and the demands for labor are higher, you're gonna to continue to see the kind of wage acceleration that, that we, you know, we've been observing. And so that's, um, I think that's part of the story for sure. Okay. Uh, here's one from Lauren Onisorge of Triangle Business Journal. She says, can you elaborate more on the Fed potentially engineering a recession, what that could look like. What is the point where they have no choice but to react in that way? Yeah, so again, remember their dual mandate. Their dual mandate is to manage inflationary expectations and the health of the labor market. And they struggle with that in a way that's kind of knife edge that they have to walk. But when inflationary pressures are continuing, the fear of every central banker, the correct fear based on historical problems that we've seen not for a long time, but we've seen them in the past, is that inflationary expectations then start to become altered. So if inflationary pressures continue, 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 then we all start to behave differently. We start to contract differently. Economic activity starts to then um, be modified because we start to believe that inflation is going to continue to be higher going forward. And the nature of our then actions start to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so it's incredibly important for a central bank to make sure that inflationary expectations do not become sort of, you know, unmoored or unrooted. And so that, that's, their, that's going to be the reason why they will necessarily lean in. And it's been 40 years in this country since anyone ever remembered that. And so there's no uh, person, you know, stay below 60 or so that has managed anything in that context. But nevertheless, that's really important. And so what, what then that means is if they're going to have to continue to raise rates to force some economic slowdown, then that will create some, um, some pain, for lack of a better word, for, um, you know, for a subset of laborers that will be displaced. It's, it's, a, it's a painful trade-off that, the, that they have to face in, in that sense. But it is an understanding that the long-run costs of high inflation are very painful and don't, don't forget, the long-run cost of high inflation are most painful for the folks at the lower end of the income distribution. So it is not about wealthy asset owners versus laborers. It is about challenges that laborers and households face along a different dimension. And, uh, and that's ultimately what the Fed is going to do. Now, that doesn't mean that the Fed is going to engineer a recession. It's like, we also have a kind of bi a recency bias, which is like our last recession was the Great Depression, the Great Recession you know, the financial crisis, or our last recession was, you know, uh, you know, something painful like COVID. It could be very modest in, in the sense that we, we normally have recessions. They, you know, last for a few quarters. They're not the worst thing ever. And so, you know, a recession could be, could be milder. And that's indeed, I think, a reasonable expectation. But it, I think the Fed is going to have no choice but to take some of the froth off the labor market in order to tackle the inflationary concerns before we get rooted inflationary expectations, because those are very dangerous and they're really hard to un unroot. And interesting that you mentioned too, that uh, for a lot of business people, this is uncharted waters because it's been a long time since we've seen yeah. things coming together like this. Before. That's right. So new challenges for everybody. Uh, this is a follow-up from Warren, but it's a question that came up from, from among several media folks. Any thoughts on how CEOs in the triangle should be looking at these numbers? Yeah, so I think you know the the dichotomy in, in a way is is a bit challenging in the following sense. One is, you know, there are pieces of the labor market that are still remarkably tight. And so to the extent that CEOs, you know, despite some looming challenges, nevertheless have compelling business opportunities, growth opportunities, new initiatives, you know, one impediment to realizing those opportunities still is a tight labor market. I think that's just the reality. Uh, and so 
you know, the, the, the growth in the labor market and the tightness and the wage acceleration that we continue to see is, I think, just a testament to that. On the flip side, however, because that's going to, in the aggregate sense, you know, force the Fed to continue to move, that does mean that, um, you know, we're, we're going to continue to see financing costs move in a direction that, um, you know, business leaders, CEOs, CFOs haven't seen for a really long time. And so it's going to be this kind of double challenge, which is like, I want to lean in to growth opportunities, but the labor consideration is going to remain and, and we're going to have to continue to pay more there. Um, and then on my financing side, I think we're going to start to see some, you know, continued squeezes as financial conditions start to tighten, continue to tighten. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's one from Jason Parker of WRAL TechWire. Uh, are we seeing anything of note in the labor force participation rate? And this kind of goes into some of the things you were talking about. Yeah. So, so the labor force participation rate um, falls very modestly this month. So it kind of moves a little bit in the wrong direction. Uh, and I think, um, you know, that that could be a little noise. It's hard to say. It's a it's a, a modest blip. We'd like that to continue to, to move up for the reasons I articulated before. Um, but I think if you kind of look, you know, ignoring like maybe the blip of this month and, and then what we might discern about that, I would say the prime age labor force participation has kind of continued to climb. As I said, it's that 55 and older that seems really sticky. And so that one. May, may never rebound <laughs> in the way that we've seen before. I think that's just, that's, you know, a collection of baby boomers and such and, and a little younger that are, you know, just acting differently post COVID period. Okay. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't want to let you get away without a midterm election question, which has come up yeah, with sure. a couple of people. Um, I guess in general, the idea of how next week's midterm elections might impact job growth, other effects that you might see coming out of those? Well, I think, um, you know, clearly it's going to be hard to call this one. I'm not a political scientist. It looks like it's neck and neck. Uh, and so, you know, let's call it a 50-50. Um, and so, you know, if, if one side or the other prevails, that obviously has different implications for different priorities, um, you know, with respect to you know, what this means for regulation, for example, or what this means for, you know, supporting the labor market. But I think probably the biggest takeaways for me are maybe two. One is the, um, no matter which side it goes, it's going to be a very divisive and polarized Washington. That's not going away. And I think that's making it harder for business leaders to make decisions. And so, however, this, you know, kind of cracks out one way or the other, I don't really think it, it changes anything. Um, it's just a, it's and then with that, then the second point is that that just continues to give kind of a tailwind to volatility and uncertainty. And so that's not good for financial markets. It's not good for you know economic agents. And so um, I don't profess to know how this is going to shake out, but I'm pretty sure this isn't going to be good for adding any you know real clarity in um, what is the the policy or um, regulatory landscape by which. Um, then business leaders and financial market participants can feel good allocating capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there or should there be any expectation of change in the way the Fed behaves after the midterms, regardless I, of how they come out? I desperately hope not. So mm -hmm. just to be very clear, um, a Fed, any central bank, any central bank is best when it is apolitical. It should be run by technocrats. Uh, and that's because we should not have monetary policy decisions being um, influenced by election cycles because that never works out. There's always an incentive for whatever elected leadership to try to juice an economy to make people feel good in <laughs> leading up to an election. And so we want that instead to be run by technocrats that are doing what is, um, you know, kind of, you know, best inferred uh, about, uh, you know, it, from, from the relevant data. And that doesn't mean they're always right. So technocrats can be wrong. I'm not suggesting that, but we don't want them to be influenced by political forces. And so, you know, to the extent that, you know, in an earlier era, you know, maybe Trump was putting pressure on Powell or right now Elizabeth Warren is putting pressure on Powell. I, I don't think that's helpful. I just don't. And I'm, I'm not going to blame one party or the other because they've all done it. But it is important for a central bank to be relatively independent 
otherwise bad incentives start to materialize and all that does is in the long run increase inflationary pressures for a society and that's bad let me slip one more question in here before we leave for the day uh and this is from uh, preston bergen uh, in the triangle area he says the headline unemployment rate is relatively low but this statistic can be misleading how problematic is the lower workforce participation rate particularly for prime age workers one recent estimate placed the number of prime age workers not seeking employment at roughly 9 million and predominantly male. So back again yeah. to that question of the labor force. Yeah, so again, maybe there's two, two, trend, two um, frequencies to talk about. One is the one I've already articulated, which is that prime age workforce, that participation has been climbing back up from COVID and it's getting close to where it was pre-COVID um you know that that blipped off a little bit this month as i mentioned but nevertheless it's 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 kind of moving in the right direction and so <laughs> that's that's good news the second frequency and i think that gets a little bit to the the crux of the problem which is if we even look beyond covid and we look over the last you know couple of decades um male uh participation has been falling and there are some really serious concerns, policy concerns, about economic opportunity for um, you know for for males of a certain age, of a certain kind of skill set, and indeed some of this might even be linked to um, to some of the challenges of globalization and some of the challenges to be perfectly candid about the opioid, opioid crisis. And so there is some really interesting work on what we call deaths of despair, which are economic opportunities sort of creating. Um, limited economic opportunity, creating an environment towards alcoholism and, and, and opioid abuse, particularly among that population. And so that kind of slow moving decline in male labor force participation is a very serious problem. And we, we, need, to, we need to be attending to that, but that's a little bit at a frequency that maybe frustratingly is different from the frequency we're talking about here, which is sort of the post COVID recovery. I, I would I would say it that way. Yeah. Okay. Lots to think about. Well, thank you very much, Christian, for your great analysis as always, and taking on all comers in terms of questions. Sure. Uh, that's always a fun part of the show. Uh, also, thanks very much to our audience today. We appreciate you being here, and as always, you brought us some great questions, so we appreciate that. Uh, to the members of the media, we'd love to continue the conversation with you. If you would like to talk to Professor Lindblad or uh, any of our other experts, please reach out to me. I'm at rob underscore nap at keenan-flagler.unc.edu. And for all of you, we'd love for you to check out our website so that you can see what's going on with our latest research. One thing for you to look for is the American Growth Project, which we launched last uh, month. A lot of interesting things there to look for. So please check that out. We're at keenaninstitute.unc.edu. Uh, that is all we have for you today. Again, we appreciate you being here. We'll be back on December 2nd, which is the next time we will have a jobs report to talk about. We hope to see you then. Thanks very much and have a good Friday.